Nothing means more to us than what we share with friends. Friends. Everything we do is for the ones we care about each day. In the Twin Cities we will stay for friends. WCCO TV for friends. WCCO TV for friends. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Moore and Doug Moore. At the outset, and in response to the myriad phone calls we receive every night at 10.30, we would like to make it clear at this time that we are not related. <laughs> Don't let him kid you, I'm too young to be his father. We're very pleased to see such an impressive gathering uh, with us tonight. We thank you very much for being here. We are honored by the presence of Mayor George Latimer, the Honorable George Latimer, the Mayor of St. Paul, Mayor Al Hofstede, of Minneapolis. Al, just because you've given up the ghost, you don't have to make yourself scarce, you know. He's about many civic and county officials, business leaders, officers of the court. Uh, Governor Quee was here, uh, took his leave early to attend to some business at the state capitol. How much do you suppose that's going to cost us? <laughs> also visiting from New York, Mr. Al Massini, the president of Telerep and members of Mr. Massini's uh, staff. The WCCO television family, uh, both past and present, and of course, uh, all of our friends. We're very happy and very proud uh, that you would uh, accept our invitation to be with us tonight. And why are we all here? All of you, David, myself, this magnificent Minnesota orchestra. On the surface, we're all gathered here to pay tribute to a couple of numbers, the numbers four and the number 30. Now, in the news business, you know, undoubtedly, uh, that the number 30 has a very special significance because dating back to some uh, obscure time in the history of news writing, this became a tradition for the reporter to signify the end of his news story by writing the numeral 30. Such is not the case this evening. The 30 that we celebrate tonight uh, is certainly not the end of the story. If this were the 30th anniversary of a marriage who we were celebrating this evening, most of you might be thinking, isn't it nice if they've stayed together all this long? <laughs> well, Channel 4 is certainly held together, and we hope you agree that this is very nice. But in this television business, the 30th anniversary might still be what they consider a honeymoon. Sure, we've overcome a few obstacles together, but the real challenges may still be to come. Rather than pay a superficial tribute then to the numbers 4 and 30, we prefer, prefer to consider this evening uh, a tribute to, to people. All of those people who have made the number 4 meaningful and the number 30 possible. And we're going to begin, of course, with the hundreds of thousands, and we'd like to think presumptuously enough, perhaps, millions of people out there who have been watching us all these years. During Channel 4's 30 years on the air, one generation has watched television grow up. The other generation has grown up watching television. But all of us in this business have done some growing up in the last 30 years. Indeed we have, and we just stopped to look and see at what television, the television industry has become today, because to many of us, uh, July 1st, 1949, uh, seems only like yesterday. That's when Channel 4, with a sum total of 26 employees, first went on the air. The FCC established that date as the deadline for Channel 4 to get on the air, and after much scrambling, the deadline was beaten by just six hours. The very fact that there was a deadline at all may be attributed to the efforts of one F. Van Kenneinenberg, who many have called uh, the father of Channel 4. And while this is a tribute to people on both sides of the television screen, the story of Channel 4 can't be told without reference to equipment and technology. On July 1st, 1949, that amounted to one studio, one studio camera, a film camera, two mobile unit cameras, and a projector. Channel 4 signed on at 3 p.m., took a half hour break from 6 to 6.30, then signed off at 9 p.m. And at this same time, the station was making the move from the Wesley Temple building to the corner of 9th and LaSalle. So this was not an auspicious start 
but after all, TV was only a toy at that time, and we uh, must keep in mind that in 1949, there was no way for a station way, way out there in Minnesota to receive and transmit signals from New York. All programming had to be live or on film. And with those resources, Channel 4 squeaked through those six months in the 40s when it was uh, first on the air, next came the 50s, a decade of incredible change for television in general and Channel 4 in particular. Before we get down to some specifics of the 50s, let's settle back and we're going to get into the mood of the 50s. And we're going to remember them through the Minnesota Orchestra under the direction of Henry Charles Smith. Maestro.
Now's the time, Ollie. Sorry for they jumping They stop playing and we're up here. Yes. That's all there is to it, okay? I recognize Ellington. Doug recognizes Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> Bashing right along. September 30, 1950. Coaxial cable pushing west reached the Twin Cities. And you know, Dave, 1950 was not really so very long ago, but I can listen to the event, uh, list, list that as really tying in with earlier uh, pioneer milestones like the railroad and the telegraph. Actually, the coaxial cable was a very significant coming. A Channel 4 then could pick up live network programs from both the ABC and DuMont television networks, both of which had uh, early affiliations with Channel 4, and of course, uh, from the CBS television network, an affiliation, as we all know, that was much longer lived. But still live programming. Or uh, crude kinescopes filmed off the cable screening of live programs. But how about news? At first, Channel 4 uh, presented news reels every Friday night, not unlike uh, the newsreels you saw in the movie theaters with the film titles and the background music and the, the da, 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 da kind of thing. Then we leased a, uh, a wire photo machine and a very elegant man named John Ford. Many of you may remember him from the WTCN radio days. Cliff Ryan, John Ford, uh, began delivering a daily five-minute newscast called Close-Ups in the News, and we advertised it saying you could actually see it as he told it. Uh, Bill Wigginton summarized the newsreels and wire photos on Sunday evenings. Uh, Jim Boyson forecast the weather, and both Raleigh Johnson and Dick Siebert, who was just beginning his long tenure as the University of Minnesota baseball coach, uh, read the sports news. And Chick McCoon became Channel 4's news director in 1951. WCCO-TV had a newsreel at noon and another at 6.10, with a headline summary at 10.30. Chick wanted to turn all three of these into newscasts. This brought up an interesting question at that time. What is a television newscast? Do you show whatever interesting pictures you can find and talk about them, or you do, do you deliver the news supplemented by whatever pictures you can find? Just about this time, Gordon Bartouche was hired as the first Channel 4 photographer, and that was to lead to at least part of the answer. The station bought a black and white film processor. We call it the Houston. Actually, more affectionately, we called it Big Ugly. And a fellow named Don Pat Potratz cut camera to air time to a mere 30 minutes. And then in addition to that, uh, we lifted clips from the newsreel footage that we had, uh, such as the clip of the um, Korean peace negotiators walking in and out of the tent. And as you'll recall, that story went on for months, and whenever the story was mentioned, we'd run the film over and over again, <laughs> and no one knew the difference. That's still not bad, but it was still a toy. A television now was beginning to lose some of its toy image, in January 1951, when the Minneapolis schools were closed by a strike, Channel 4 responded. For two hours each morning, the studio was turned over to selected pupils and teachers uh, who went through the lessons on the air. They figured an estimated 30,000 students watched voluntarily. As a matter of fact, and we can say voluntarily, many of the students wrote in uh, asking for more. Well, if television was a toy, it was a most valuable toy. And that brings us to August 17th of 1952, the date that Channel 4 became WCCO Television. Until this time, Channel 4 had been WTCN-TV. Uh, but CBS, at the same time, owned a WCCO radio. CBS wanted a television station in the market. As a result of a merger and the formation of a new company, Midwest Radio and Television Incorporated, WCCO Radio and WTCN Television came under the same ownership and the call letters became WCCO Television. Is that clear? <laughs> now, at this point, it's proper, appropriate time to give credit to a couple of other people who are to help forge the WCCO Television today. Uh, Rev, bless his soul, the late William J. McNally, chairman of Midwest. Uh, Henry Dornsife joined the company in 1952, but he became the company's chief financial officer. And Robert Ritter was the president. And at this point, I have to stop and tell a little anecdote. In 1970 or 71, the WCCO radio announcing staff went on strike. Roger Erickson, Charlie Boone, Steve Cannon, all those highly paid performers over there went out on strike. Mr. Ritter and Larry Haig, who later became vice president and general manager, assumed many of the announcing duties. Haig got up there one day ahead of Ritter. Ritter walked through the picket line, went up there, and Haig said, I just walked through, walked through the richest picket line in radio history. 
Raiders said, welcome to the richest announcing staff. <laughs> And now, now Robert Ritter, hold on to your hat, folks, is getting paid for doing radio and television commercials and voiceover for industrial films. <laughs> so it all worked out fine. Well, okay, following this transaction, WTCN Radio and the WTCN TV call letters went their separate ways. The remainder of the 50s was a period of real growth and change for WCCO television. New equipment, new technology, expansion of Radio City Theater Building, uh, which is the home of the uh, station and its studios, and people. I never knew Cedric Adams, although he was there in my home at 12 noon every day. But his legend is certainly interwoven into the fabric of the Upper Midwest and WCCO TV. Cedric Adams, an institution for so many years, uh, with his 10, 10 p.m. news on WCCO radio, uh, Cedric Adams pioneered, uh, formed the concept of the 10 o'clock news, uh, much as we know it today. I and mean, of course, you know the old story. Uh, pilots flying over rural Minnesota reported they knew exactly when it was 10.15 uh, because all the people waited up to collectively turn off their lights uh, at the same time. Uh, we would like to presume that the pilots may have had watches too, but this is the story they tell. Cedric then would be one of the very few people who worked for both the separately operated WCCO radio and WCCO television. In his first TV, his first TV news show was on WCCO television in 1953, and even though uh, this first newscast did not go all that smoothly, uh, his secretary, Bernie McGill, uh, came through the studios the next day passing out $50 checks and thank yous from Cedric for jobs well done. So Cedric Adams was not easily forgotten. Good evening. There's a happy household in rural Ramsey County tonight, happier than most because, as they say, all is well that ends well. The camera of WCCO-TV cub reporter Joe Sullivan tells the story. And also in 1953, Senators Ed Thigh and Hubert Humphrey pressed a key in Washington, D.C. to signal WCCO-TV's power increase to 100,000 watts. We were only the fourth station in the nation to operate with this maximum power under FCC rules. On June 30th of 1954, WCCO Television was the host station to pool feed the total eclipse of the sun to both CBS and to NBC. And in October of 1954, WCCO Television broadcast the first local live program in color. A one camera telecast of Axel and his dog. Axel. <laughs> Axel Cullen Card, of course. How appropriate uh, that he too should be a part of our milestone tonight. How many of us grew up with this uh, wonderful, talented performer? How many of us uh, remember him with so much love and so much affection today? Hi, kids. This is Axel. Happy Sunday to you. It's about half past ten. It should be around where you live. Oh, say, I know a poem. Would you like to have me recite the poem? <laughs> oh, this really is good. Now, here it is. Would you like to hear it? There was a rat, and there was a cat. Now the cat is fat, where the rat is at. <laughs> Ain't that good? <laughs> Oh, quit hitting me, quit hitting me. <laughs> Boy, these are rasserinos, aren't they? Keep sending them in. We like to hear from you, kids, you know. Knock-knocks and riddles and all of them things. Keep sending them right into old Axel here on Canal 4, will you? Maria, little jelly hopped upon my windowsill. Cocked her shining eye and such. What did you do with the keyhole, little bow? Peep. <laughs> Ain't that right? Uh, oh. <clears throat> Mary Davies was to join Clellan in 1958 and be his ever-present on-air partner until his untimely death. And in case you didn't recognize him, Axel's puppet was none other than Don Stoltz Incognito. So many names come to mind from that era. Uh, of live television, Arlie Haberly, uh, whose employment with WCCO-TV's parent company, the old WTCN, dated way back to 1937. Arlie was the hostess for one of the first local live television programs, and I remember it particularly well because it was my first day on announced booth duty in that July of 19, uh, 1950. 
Bill Metchnick was the director in the control room, and we had a, the announcer had a book in his booth with the copy in it like this. And the theme came up for Around the Town, and Bill cued me, and I read, Good afternoon. Welcome to Around the Town with Arlie Haley, Haberly, Arlie intro's guest and Q's first commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Remember? That was but the first of many monumental goofs that were to come. We don't mention the night I was making a pitch for Del Monte asparagus tips. <laughs> Didn't come out that way. <laughs> Suffice it to say that Del Monte had the dubious distinction of having one of the most short-lived advertising <laughs> campaigns in television floor history. <laughs> Mentioning other people in that era, uh, Gwen Harvey, who was one of the loyal staffers from the start of Channel 4 and stepped in when uh, Arlie Haberly passed away. It's so important to what WCCO television is today with these other contributors to that special on-air personality during the live era of the 50s. Dick Enroth and Bob Casey, who took over sports when Raleigh Johnson took over the news directorship. Gene Gott, who rewrote Chick McEwen's copy to make it sound less democratic. And Don <laughs> Padilla's copy to make it sound less Republican. Remember Jack Hastings, Mel Jass, Jane Johnson, Harry Siles, who worked both sides of the camera, Ed Scott, who played while his wife Peg sang. There are so many others that are not mentioned, and we just don't have time to mention, plus all of the unsung heroes <coughs> off camera who helped to get WCCO television off to a good start. Uh, Doug, we have to mention two more. In between there sometime in the late in the early 60s uh, was Dick Enroth. Dick Enroth was uh, made his name, of course, as the trigger-mouthed, extremely capable play-by-play -play commentator of Miller's and uh, Lakers games, uh, joined our staff. Uh, he, he created the, uh, the Enrothisms, one of which was, the rain is coming down in a precipitous manner. <laughs> also want to take a, mention, a moment to mention here the lady who hired me in July 1950. She was our program director, Judy Bryson. Judy, are you here? I thank you, the whole family thanks you, and I hope you're still exercising that same good judgment, Judy. <laughs> We've had uh, fun here with the shortcomings of the 50s, but those were the natural shortcomings, of course, of a very complicated industry that was still in its infancy. Uh, WCCO Television closed out the decade by winning the University of Missouri and the Encyclopedia Britannica Award as the Outstanding News Film Station of the Year. Uh, videotape machines were being installed to end the live era, as we knew it, and of course to herald new opportunities for the 60s. The 60s, as remembered for us now by the Minnesota Orchestra.
Well, WCCO television entered the 60s the same way it left the 50s, by winning a few awards. In 1960, the Radio Television News Directors Association named WCCO the television the winner for outstanding reporting of a community problem. After 1961, WCCO Television won broadcasting's highest and most significant award, the George Foster Peabody Award for Meritorious Local Public Service Programming. The 60s at WCCO-TV was a decade of technological advancement under the guidance of our longtime chief engineer, John Sherman. In 1962, our technical crew was responsible for the origination of a Telstar communication satellite broadcast live from the Black Hills. New, specially built equipment for all three studios and master control. Uh, the FCC finalized its grant for television towers at Shoreview. A new color switchers, new color cameras, a color film processor, a 40-foot mobile cruiser, and videotaping capability second to none. Toward the end of the 60s, Larry Haig, the longtime Mr. WCCO Radio, moved up to executive vice president and then to president of Midwest. He joined Van Kenneinenberg on the executive committee of the corporation, and uh, at that time, Sherm Headley, longtime assistant to Van, took over as WCCO-TV's general manager. And of course, we must pay tribute right now to the dedicated engineers and the technical people of the decade who were responsible for these and many other tremendous achievements. Although we shouldn't leave the impression that the 60s was a decade that was solely dedicated to the electronics of the business. For instance, in November of 1962, a brash youngster actor, booth announcer, variety show, and bolorama host. So confident in his five years as anchorman that he threw caution to the wind, and he decided that uh, he would actually go on the air with the programming of Anchorman. fiery host with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Happy New Year! The son of bedtime news. From out of the past come the blundering footsteps of the great newsmakers. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear when a masked man disguised as a mild-mannered anchorman for Channel 4 and his faithful film editing companion, Finberg, fight a never-ending battle to bring news, weather, and sports to the old Northwest. The Bedtime News rides again. Oh, boy, big deal. And now, here's your host. That stupid show ran for nearly 10 years. I took more abuse from that stupid show. And now your host for the stupid show, Dave Moore. I don't know why we can't leave well enough alone. The first, uh... <laughs> Thank you. That program was on the air five years before it even got a number in the ratings book. <laughs> Mr. Ken Kenanenberg, Van Kenanenberg, heard about it from his friends at the Minneapolis Club. <laughs> we were trying to prosecute the end of our involvement in the Vietnam War. And Mr. Van Kenanenberg didn't act with lightning speed. Two years later, he mentioned it to me. <laughs> what the hell are you doing on Saturday nights, he said. <laughs> My first uh, damaging reaction of the first program came from my mother, who had not seen the program, but a neighbor had. She told my mother about it, and the next day my mother called me and said, were you drunk on the air last night? <laughs> well, let's move on. This is the first time I heard about Bolorama, so... Uh... <laughs> On January 8th of 1968, the scene tonight was first telecast with Bud Kraling's Weather, Hal Scott Sports, Skip Losher was on Action News, George Rice's editorial comment, and anchorman Dave Moore. No question, that was a very big moment in my life, but there was someone else uh, that Doug mentioned there, somebody who has been uh, as much of the fiber of WTCCO-TV as anybody, in fact, perhaps even more. <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, Bob, friends, and you're coming up next. <laughs> this is a good time to mention that person, a propitious time, because he has been in the employ of this station longer than any living person. He started with... <laughs> In 1946, with the old WTCN radio and the old Wesley Temple building, and he's been with us ever since. Bud Kraling.
was worth it to stick around just for that, wasn't it? <laughs> I want to take a second to tell you how Bud Quailing became our weatherman. And this is a story that Robert Franzen, the current manager of WTCN Television, enjoys telling, so we'll tell it here. Uh, Bob Franzen, very capable, very competent, was our weatherman in 1952. He made the rather questionable decision of taking a vacation. Uh, <laughs> Bud filled in for two weeks and 27 years. <laughs> and uh, And as you know, we very well know, Mr. Franzen went on to a faith that none of us deserve. <laughs> Bud has stood in front of that weather window, in spite of obscene gestures from 9th Street. <laughs> he has risked his very life atop that tottering shell weather tower. He's been a, a rock to work with, he's just an honor to work with, and he's been a, a dear, dear friend. Over the last 30 wonderful years, there have been a number of attempts to make me laugh while I was in the middle of one of my wonderful partly cloudy forecasts, such as a, a cameraman appearing in a Halloween mask looking from behind his camera, somebody set, setting fire to my weather forecast off camera. Uh, I even heard one time there was an envelope of money being held in escrow that would go to the first person that could make me laugh on the air. Well, I did once, but I did it all by myself. Dave and I were talking about the opening of the bow and arrow deer hunting season in Wisconsin, and we said it was going to be a rather cool morning. And I said, it'll be okay if you keep your quiver warm. 